Um, I think we'd all agree that we live in an extremely noisy world. And I think it's important to try and find some pockets of silence in this noisy world. And a lot of people say, might say it's impossible, but I can tell you it's, it's not. Um, um, some of the topics around silence that I consider are maybe fairly obvious. Silent retreats, meditation, solitude. Anyone embarking on a spiritual path will probably encounter silence along the way, since silence is at the core of most religions. The book examines both historical and contemporary figures who have advocated the importance of silence and who show how crucial it is for creativity, harmony, and relating to others. There's nothing more important than, or one of the most important things is listening to other people. And you can't listen to other people if you've got a head full of things which aren't silent. Okay, so let's start with a minute's silence. Thank you. And we're not even to the word. Thank you. Okay, so that was just one minute, and I expect for, well actually, because this is a talk in Watkins, probably most people here might be used to meditating and, and, and silence, but when you're agitated, like I was thinking, when's the minute going to be up, when's the minute going to be up, so it's, it's um, time as a funny relationship to silence. One of the things which is interesting is that really it's only in the last hundred years that we've been able to eliminate silence at the press of a button. Because before the advent of radio, television, social media, etc., etc., you needed someone else to break that silence with, unless you screamed silently, or unless you screamed on your own and silently. So that's, it is, it's a very, it's a modern phenomenon, this. Um, and I write, there are several people, I think Aldous Huxley was one of them, who ranted against the radio. Um, but that's all in the book, which I hope you'll all buy. Now, one of the triggers <coughs> for my own, for this book, was my journey to the Antarctic. And I'll just read a short passage about how this happened. It was there in the Antarctic that I experienced the most profound silence of my life. A few passengers had left the Russian icebreaker and climbed into inflatable dinghies, to weave in and out of multi-blued icebergs. At some point, all the engines were turned off. We were totally still and totally quiet. And then it began to snow. There was a real feeling of completeness. Many years later, I can still conjure up that feeling of connection and wholeness. It was one of the most profound moments of my life. I think these experiences are often referred to as peak experiences, a term that makes me feel slightly uneasy. Maybe that's because the letdown can be brutal. My experience in the Antarctic was something that just happened. Yes, I had to be open to it, but there was no anticipation and therefore no letdown afterward. Indeed, the aftermath brought a feeling of deep peace. Now, someone else um, who wrote about the harmony and the, in the Antarctic was Admiral Richard Byrd, B-Y-R-D. I don't know how many people here have heard of him. He was American. 
and he was in the Antarctic in the 1930s uh, doing research. And one Antarctic winter, three people were meant to be going to a camp where they would be on their own for, a, I don't know, three, three months or something like that. And at the last minute, one of them fell out. And he didn't want to let two people go on their own. So he volunteered to go on his own. Um, he actually became quite ill because there was um, leaking of um, some carbon dioxide. He got poisoned. But before that, he wrote, and this, remember, this was someone who was an extraordinary explorer. He'd been all over the world, but he was, you know, very sort of macho. And for him to write about feelings was quite extraordinary for the time. Um, his book was published in 1938, short description of what he wrote. He saw Venus in the West as an unblinking diamond with her twinkling counterpart in the East both set off in an exquisite sea of blue. The colours were subdued and not numerous, the jewels few, the setting simple. I paused to listen to the silence. My frozen breath hung like a cloud overhead. The day was dying, the night being born, but with great peace. Harmony, that was it. He found a rhythm in the silence, the strain of a perfect chord, the music of the spheres, perhaps. He found himself part of the rhythm. In that instant, I could feel no doubt of man's oneness with the universe. He believed that there had to be a purpose to the whole and that humankind had to be part of it and was no accident. It was a feeling that transcended reason, that went to the heart of man's despair and found it groundless. The universe was a cosmos, not a chaos. Man was as rightfully a part of that cosmos as were the day and night. In the book, he often refers to the harmony that he believed existed in the world. And it is this harmony that links the Tao, the music of the spheres, a term used by the astronomer Johannes Kepler in 1619, who suggested that the planets in the solar system generated harmonies as they orbited the sun. With harmony, no spoken language is needed to communicate. There can be a connection with others on a deep level in silence. Um, nature, a lot of people go to, to nature in search of silence. And of course, nature can be very, very noisy if you think about earthquakes, storms, the sea, the wind. Um, Pythagoras said, learn to be silent. Let your quiet mind listen and absorb the silence. I don't know how many people here know of Annie Dillard, who I think is a wonderful contemporary American writer who writes about um, nature, mostly. And she, her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, she describes the silence of nature and how you get, have to get ready to listen by emptying yourself and being wholly attentive. After a time you hear it, there is nothing there. You feel the world's word as a tension, a hum, a single chorus note everywhere the same. This is it. This hum is the silence. There is a vibrancy to the silence, a suppression, as if someone were gagging the world. The silence is not actually a suppression. Instead, it is all there is. She's an author, I think, who's very well worth reading. Um, there was a project in America to find the most silent place. Well, the most silent places are actually anechoic chambers. I don't know whether anyone here has been in one or knows what they are. They're chambers that have absolutely no um, echo. And if uh, astronauts, for example, have to spend time in an anechoic chamber for, before going into space, um, I was on, I don't know whether anyone heard, front row a few weeks ago, and Tom Service, who was interviewing me, uh, said that he had been in an anechoic chamber. Well, the maximum time you're allowed to spend is 45 minutes, and most people freak out after 10. He said he, he, he stayed the course. Um, but in America, this project of finding the most silent place in nature uh, it was called One Square Inch, and it's, you can see it on YouTube. 
There's a, it is literally one square inch, and it's an Olympic National Park in Washington State, in the northwest of, of America. And I think it's about three or four kilometers walk from the car park. Um, of course, it's not silent because it's in the middle of a forest and there are lots of forest sounds, but no aeroplanes fly overhead. And so this is designated as the most silent place. Um, there are many people who can't bear the modern world. There's a, a guy called Christopher Knight, who was known as the North Pond Hermit, and he lived in Maine for 27 years without being discovered. And he was seemingly very close to other people's houses. Um, but I suppose other people were mostly there during holiday time. Um, he used to steal food from them, and they couldn't really, they couldn't understand what was happening. And he used to borrow books. And interestingly, because he lived in complete silence himself, apparently he remembered everything he read. So that's another interesting thing about silence. Anyway, finally he was caught and unfortunately had to go to prison. But um, he allowed a journalist to visit him. And this journalist, whose name I've temporarily forgotten, but it's in the bibliography, wrote a book about him. Um, Max Picard, who was a Swiss philosopher, wrote about snow. Well, snow is a wonderful muffling um, form of weather. Um, and he wrote, in winter, silence is visible. Snow is silence become visible. I thought that was, that's a very, I, I love that sentence. And of course, fog is another um, weather, weather that is silent, muffles things. A great and silent ceiling, said Mallarmé. Um, deserts are considered other silent places. In the third century, um, the desert fathers went off and lived solitary lives in the desert, uh, joined later by women known as desert mothers. I personally had two desert experiences. One was in the Wahiba Desert in Amman. And I was staying with a friend who was working out there and with two other women friends. And this guy decided it would be a good adventure for us to go and spend a night in the desert. So he put us on camels and sent us off into the desert. And he said, when you get to a certain sand dune, the camel driver will leave you, but somebody will come with a truck and tents and this, that and the other. Well, the camel driver left us. No, no truck, nothing. And it was quite scary, actually, uh, although I, I had a phone and I was able to read, I mean, to ring my friend in, in um, his house. And I, he said, but where are you? And I thought, <laughs> describe the sand dune. Anyway, <laughs> we arrived and we had a very noisy night, actually, because although the wind was meant to drop at sunset, it didn't. Um, and so cooking uh, supper wasn't. And then the other time was a very different experience. Um, in Botswana, um, the great salt pan with a can't unpronounceable name of the desert, I'm afraid. Um, uh, but at sunset again, just walking into this because the feeling of space that was flat, whereas the one in Oman had lots of sand dunes. This was totally flat, and this 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 vast expanse had a real feeling of silence. Martin Buckley, who is a contemporary writer, travel writer. Uh, is obsessed by deserts and he decided to get married in the desert but because he he actually um, instructed his wife to be to find the perfect desert to get married in. Um, obviously rel all religions I think have some element of silence in them. Um, silent prayer became viewed with suspicion in, in Christianity and I think this is very interesting. I had always thought the churches were locked to prevent theft. In fact, apparently they were locked because silent prayer was considered immoral. <laughs> because what might you be thinking and who might you be praying to? Um, meditation, which uh, as people from the West, so many people went to the East, to India, 
in the 60s looking for meditation. Whereas in fact, there is a great um, tradition of meditation within the West, within Christianity. Um, John Main was one of the first people who sort of re refound it, if you like, and he established something called the World Community for Christian Meditation, to which I belong, which is now run by uh, Lawrence, Father Lawrence Freeman. Um, but the other, other people who brought meditation to the West or rediscovered it are Thomas Merton, again, extremely popular during the 60s, Bede Griffiths, um, whose ashram I went to a couple of times in, in um, India, and he, was, he bridged the gap between East and West. It's the first, only time I've ever done that. I read his book, Marriage of East and West, and went to India to, to meet him. That must have been early 90s, I think. Um, William Johnston, who was a Jesuit uh, <coughs> priest who spent most of his adult life in Japan, wrote, he's written quite a lot, but one of the things he wrote was, one's tradition, one's own tradition is a fact. And William Johnston, a Jesuit priest who lived most of his life in Japan, where he was actively involved in interfaith dialogue, echoes Thich Nhat Hanh in saying how important our own traditions and roots, which include silent meditation, are. It has always seemed to me that the psychologically realistic way of doing things is to stand in the stream of one's own tradition and humbly take what is good and valuable from another. Since he knew Japan so well, Johnston wrote, in Japan, any clown can tell the difference between wise talk and foolish talk, but it takes a good master to distinguish between wise silence and foolish silence. <clears throat> and obviously there's um, silence in Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism. And the silence of contemplation or meditation is a great unifier of past, present and future. When language ceases, silence begins. I find there's a real bond between the past. You can really connect to the past when, it, when you're silent in a way that's impossible when there's noise. Um, I have actually never meditated with children, but uh, evidently some children, some schools start the day with meditation, very short meditation. But Kathleen Norris, who's an American writer, realized that elementary school children's imaginations could be liberated by silence. They became much more thoughtful when they wrote about silence rather than when they wrote about noise, perhaps because there are fewer cliches about silence. Some of the ideas that the children produced were poetical and original, such as slow and silent as a tree and Silence is spiders spinning their webs, but perhaps the most profound of all, silence reminds me to take my soul with me wherever I go. I think that's extraordinary from a child. Um, in, in the book, I also look at ways of finding silence through the arts. Art can move us and can be a way into harmony, peace and silence. Architecture, art, music, literature and poetry all can bring us to a profound silence. The same Swiss philosopher Max Picard, uh, who wrote about snow, wrote, great poetry is a mosaic inlaid into silence. And literature, of course, is full of poetry and prose that encourage silence, starting with the dark, joyless and silent world of Beowulf and continuing through the works of Wordsworth, Tennyson, D. H. Lawrence, Norris Thomas, among others. Proust wrote, books are the creation of solitude and the children of silence. So not only did poets and authors write about silence, but um, they also could only create when they were, were silent. And Proust was fanatical about silence, about writing in silence. Um, one of D.H. Lawrence's poems called Snake, which I particularly like, doesn't ever actually mention the word silence, but I think it's, you just feel it in the poem. He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily, a 
as one who is drunken, and flickered his tongue like a forked night on the air, so black, seeming to lick his lips, and looked around like a god, unseeing into the air, and slowly turned his head, and slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length, curving round, and climb against the broken bank of my wall face. Uh, Emerson compiled a list of classics or sacred books that merited being read silently. Let us be silent so that we may hear the whispers of the gods. And the contemporary writer Colm Toybin finds that the amount of silence around things is a frequent starting point for his work. Virginia Woolf wanted to write a novel about silence, but her approach was the things that people don't say. And she achieves it in Mrs. Dalloway, I think. And Tracy Chevalier, uh, who, her novel, The Last Runaway, which is about the Quakers and the Underground Railroad in America, is full of Quaker silence. Engaging with paintings on a deep level is another way into silence. They can use a silent language to speak to us. I personally, I often sit in an art gallery and draw a painting. And as I do so, I'm aware of the silent link that exists between myself and the artist whose painting I'm copying. Uh, there are several genres of paintings which have seem more silent. Um, for example, you'd never think of a Bruegel painting as a silent painting. Of course, all paintings are silent, but you'd never think of a Bruegel as a silent painting. Um, Munch's scream, on the other hand, I think is a profoundly silent painting because it seems that he's not heard. His scream is, is not being heard. Uh, Caspar David Friedrich is a landscape painter who does wonderful silent landscapes, I believe. I think rather. One of the favorite, one of the paintings that I really like sitting in front of in the National Gallery just here is uh, the Zoberan's Cup of Water and a Rose, which is deceptively simple, but it just has that feeling of silence. And Mirandi's still lives. Um, uh, there's a Libyan writer, Hisham Matar. Uh, he used to spend, when he was a student in London, he said he'd spend hours or every, all his lunch times in the National Gallery, and he would look at one painting, and it would take him perhaps a month on the same painting before he went on to another painting. And he wrote a book called A Month in Siena, when he spent, he just went to look at the paintings in Siena and wrote a book about them. Um, Mark Rothko, I don't know whether anyone's been lucky enough to go to the exhibition in Paris on at the moment, but anyway, he wrote, silence is so accurate. Another form of silence, paradoxically maybe, is music. Of course, John Cage is the most famous composer who wrote uh, his piece, 4 minutes 33 seconds. But he also wrote, there's no such thing as silence, and he said people didn't understand silence, because during a performance of his piece, people were making noises, there were noises outside, people's bodies were, you know, tummies were gurgling, um, and so that was his, um, that's what he reckoned, that there was no such thing. Um, I spoke to quite a few mus musicians, and they all told me that the silent pauses are the most important things. It was slightly different. Sometimes there can be a sort of pregnant pause before a concert begins, which is wonderful. And then if there's been a really special concert at the very end, before people start applauding, there is that moment of silence. But also within pieces, um, there's quite often silence. Uh, uh, the Austrian pianist Arthur Schnabel wrote, the notes I handle no better than many pianists, but the pauses between the notes are, that is where the art resides. 
Now, darker sides of silence. Censorship is a silencing. Um, the Catholic Church had the index, which was, I think it was only abolished in the 1960s. Um, but unfortunately, today, in today's world, censorship is coming back in a major way. And so this statistic was from about a year ago when I was writing the book. Um, in America, in over 1,600 titles have been removed from libraries and schools in 32 states. And they include books like To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. The Bell Jar, Margaret Atwood. I think, I'm, I'm just horrified by that. And if you don't want to read a book, fine, don't read it. But it's interesting because To Kill a Mockingbird was on every syllabus yes, until uh, you know this. <laughs> and now it's been removed anyway. Uh, reading alone in bed was considered very depraved. <laughs> uh, and dangerous. Well, I can see the dangerous because if you were reading by candlelight, that that might have had dire consequences. But um, it was considered immoral. Um, something that started, I think, in California, not sure how long ago, uh, silent book clubs. Where I rather like the idea of this. Actually, it's you you go and meet people and read your own book. You're not reading same book as everyone else you just read for an hour in silence and then start talking about whatever I mean it's a good way to meet people have a glass of wine or whatever um, and during lockdown I it went online and I did join one of those it was very I found it rather hard to <laughs> work out the technology which was me zooming around the room <laughs> but it was definitely somewhere where people went to meet people because one guy um, said that he He'd been reading the same book for about nine months, and I think I was I was reading the biography of Sylvia Plath at the time. And that, since I was about fifty years older than anyone else, no one was interested. In them, that was. Um, the theatre is full of uh, Pinter and Beckett are full of silent pauses in the theatre, and um, that's very interesting as well. Um, war, of course, is very very noisy, but in in the trenches. There were the ominous silences as well. And if you read accounts of what was happening in the trenches, the silences actually were dreaded more because you didn't know what was going to happen. And there was that awful anticipation. Um, Remembrance Sunday was, I think it was George V who instigated the two-minute silence in 1919. Um, solitary confinement, that's another, I think, fascinating um, there is um, Christopher Burney, who was in the SAS during the war. He felt that his months of solitude had been an exercise in liberty. And that's what, so, that's what comes through with all these people who have been in solitary confinement. Um, I had been left free to drop the spectacles of the nearsighted and to scan the horizon of existence. And I believed I'd seen something there. But it was only a glimpse, a remote and tenuous apprehension of what lay behind the variety and activity of life. Now, when he was in solitary confinement, um, his neighbour started this tapping, which everyone was doing. And he was determined, he didn't want to tap, he didn't want any association with anyone else, he was, he was happy on his own. Um, Anthony Gray, who was a journalist, um, arrived in China in 1965, I think, 1967, Cultural Revolution. Um, on the way to China, he'd stopped in Hong Kong and bought a book on yoga. Um, and when he was put into house arrest, but house arrest in his own house, but he was only allowed into one room, and he was told he could take three books and he just had to grab the first three books that were there. Anyway, one of the books was the book on yoga, and he said that that completely saved his life. Um, he practiced it compulsively. Since yoga involves both body and mind, he felt that it was this that kept him sane. He believed that it was his guardian angel who on his way to Peking had led him to buy the book on yoga in Hong Kong, and that it was also his guardian angel who had ensured that the book 
had been in his bedroom at the time of his arrest. Um, a more contemporary um, solitary confinement, I don't know, just extraordinary to me, Albert Woodfox, who was a Black Panther, he spent 44 years in solitary in a, for a crime he didn't commit in that notorious Angola prison in Louisiana. Uh, he finally had his conviction overturned in 2014 and he was eventually released in 2016. Remarkably, when he talked about his incarceration, he said that mind, heart, soul and spirit, I always felt free. His experience is related in his book, Solitary. He later said that he'd prospered and wouldn't change a thing and that he wouldn't be the man he became had it not been for his time in prison. And when you think how some of us um, reacted under lockdown, it's just quite instructive, I think. Um, Solzhenitsyn writes quite a lot about the gulag and the political prisoners there. And the people seemingly who survived <coughs> best were political prisoners. Uh, and despite the psychic and physical suffering these people endured, many had moments of intense happiness and a feeling of being one with the universe in ways that they'd never experienced before. Solzhenitsyn said repeatedly that it is only the spirit that can save and only the spirit that can preserve the body. In the gulag labor camps, the most important thing became to preserve the soul. When the soul was given priority over physical needs, the physical body survived, but with the loss of the spiritual, the physical body disintegrated. Uh, an extraordinary story is there was a, um, a um, physicist, uh, astrophysicist, who was in the gulag, and he came to a complete halt in the research that he was doing in his mind. It was all in his mind because he didn't have paper, I don't think. And he'd come to one particular problem which he couldn't solve. And at that moment, a guard walked in with the, the book he needed. And so he was able to solve the problem. And then the guard realized what a mistake he'd made and came and took the book away. I mean, things like that, I think, are just extraordinary. It's, it's like um, uh, Anthony Gray having the book on yoga just there. I'd like to read, I think, one more thing. 195. Again, back to the gulag. Um, that those who gave priority to their physical selves lost both inner and outer strength. Conversely, if an individual chose to save his or her soul, the choice between saving either the body or the soul didn't have to be made. The body would follow the soul, and both body and soul would be preserved. The physical body was able to survive by listening to the inner voice the mystical power or God. It was up to the individual to access this internal force, the force that could lead to freedom. And I think that's quite a good way to end. And I just think that there are so many benefits um, and you can, you're benefiting everyone else if you become a, a good listener. Um, not many people are really good listeners. And it's a, a real art. Um, and it helps your creativity if you find silence. And I'll end with the, an Algonquin saying, talk is talk, silence is wisdom. Thank you very much. So, any questions? The, the room that you described, um, that was mentioned in the interview, that some people can, I can't remember the name. Oh, anechoic chamber. Yes. Yeah. What, what is it that just leads people to have to leave after 10 minutes? Or because it is completely silent. And, and it's and interesting. Happened, it just, they, they, they panic. They freak out, okay. apparently. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, mm. I, I think, gosh, 45 minutes, surely that would be fine. But if they, it's... Does it just do something to the brain, not having any so. stimulus? I suppose so, so. something like that. Yeah. lost our capacity. Yeah. It just shows you actually how astronauts must be very, um, very centered people, I think, actually. If I, if I can 
Yeah. That's something that apparently you can only hear two sounds when you're in the Kanekoni pool. One is the, uh, the frequency of your electrical brain activity, and the other one is your heartbeat. Oh, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I hope all the questions might be answered in the book, so I encourage you all to buy the book. <laughs> you mentioned something about a child saying something that was... I, I didn't oh, yeah. quite catch it. Um, yes, that's a lovely... Um, that's right, it was in Kathleen Norris's book. Um, well, there are three things that children wrote. As slow and silent as a tree, Silence is spiders spinning their webs. And silence reminds me to take my soul with me wherever I go. Oh, that one yes, it's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's really good. Right. Can you tell us about the, the uh, struggles of Charles Babbage? The, uh, the of <laughs> yes. um, Babbage, who was invented computers, 19. 19, a friend of Dickens, I think, wasn't he? Yes. Uh, he was absolutely obsessed by noise. By, I mean, London is noisy now, but non London was noisy then as well. Thomas Carlyle, who lived just over the river from where I live at the moment, again was obsessed by trying to be silent, and that's where the um, pleasure gardens were just there on the on the Thames. And I think it, I'm hope that I'm remembering what you wanted me to say about Babbage, 1820. Um, he, um, Carlyle was so obsessed by silence that he wanted, he made himself he, a, a room at the top of his house, which is in Cheney Walk, um, which was meant to be completely silent, where he was going to go and work. Um, but what happened was that it, the builders, I mean, it's so interesting that we think builders overrun their time now. As the builder said it would take six weeks, and it took something like six months. And the, one of the, his maid ran off with one of the builders. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came, when it, you, you can go and visit it now, it's, it's National Trust. And when it, the room was finished, it wasn't silent at all. So Babbage now, was it Babbage who, um, I think, he, that's right, he waged war on the street, because there were lots of, again, street musicians in, in, in um, the 19th century, and they, they used to play so loudly outside fashionable establishments, that, um, but they used that as a ploy, because they knew if they paid loudly, they'd be paid to leave. <laughs> <laughs> In 1864, Babbage published a chapter on street nuisances in which he summarized his numerous court appearances. On one occasion, he produced a list of 165 interruptions that he endured over a period of 80 days. His list of instruments of torture included organs, brass bands, hurdy-gurdies, drums, bagpipes, trumpets, and the human voice. He blamed tavern keepers, gin shops, and ladies of doubtful virtue for encouraging street noise. He was considered elitist and not popular, possibly because he said what he was doing was on behalf of the intellectual worker. Unfortunately for him, his efforts to suppress noise worked against him, leading one set of neighbours to hire musicians to play outside his house, another neighbour to blow a tin whistle for half an hour every day for months on end, and others to arrange for him to be followed by a mob of jeering children and get his windows broken. None of this put him off his mission, he went on writing letters to the Times and even had the support of, of Dickens, who wrote that he was daily interrupted, harassed, worried, wearied, and driven nearly mad by street musicians. Eventually a law known as Bass's Act was passed in 1864, banning street musicians from residential neighbourhoods. But it didn't come into effect quickly enough to prevent an organ grinder from playing outside Babbage's house as he lay dying. So... Um, that was Babbage. <laughs> you give advice about how to sort of create silence, for example, how to find them, create a sort of small silent space. Sort of 
Well, I mean, we okay. So London is noisy, but there are churches on the whole aren't locked. Well, some are, but a lot aren't. And churches can be very quiet, silent places to just go in and sit mm. down for a while. <coughs> Cemeteries actually um, are again um, have pockets of silence. Um, parks, you can generally find a silent piece of park. So, and these are open, available to everyone. Obviously, depending on one's living circumstances. I mean, some people live on their own and it's not difficult to find silence. If somebody's got a noisy family, it'd be very, very difficult to have a silent space at home. Um, but I mean, I live alone and I know that my tendency is turn the radio on <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Um, mm. But I certainly, I, I write, when I'm writing, I certainly write in silence. I know other, some people don't. I mean, some people listen to music when they're writing. I, I can't do that. Um, but when I'm painting, because I paint as well, um, I do tend to listen to something, actually. I think, I mean, I need my book. I'm not a particularly silent person. Yeah. Anyway. Do you um, comment at all on um, Eastern types of attitude to silence and um, the voice of God and all that is silent? Yeah. For example, this the comment that um, the Buddha talked for 30 years but said not a word, things like that. Yes, I mean, there are, uh, yes, I, I talk about Buddhism, and, yeah. Not, not in, I mean, not in any, it's not a religious book, but yes, I certainly address, because I, as I think I said, all religions have silence in, at that core. Nice quote twice. Hmm? Could, you, could you give a little quote about that? Um, not off the top of my head, I'm afraid, no, to read the book. <laughs> okay.